Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Manic Expression, the Comic Book Cast, the Reopen Nickelodeon Studios and Orlando, Florida Facebook page, and for entertainment's sake. Welcome to a brand new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia, and I'm here with a very special guest. We have writer, creator, author, and uh, producer, director, and all those things. You may know him from Clarissa Explains It All. You may know him from Bear in the Big Blue House. You may know him from his most recent book, Things I Can't Explain, and Being Audrey Hepburn. We have Mitchell Kriegman. So, Mitchell, welcome to Casual Chats. Thank you. So uh, I guess we'll uh, start from the very beginning. So where did you get your inspirations for doing writing and your first uh, TV shows or movies or maybe actors and actresses that you got like major inspirations for doing what you're doing today? Well, I just wanted to write um, from an early age. And so I was always looking for ways to do stuff. And I actually started out as a performance artist and a video artist and did that for a while in the early days of video art and eventually... My work was on, you know, PBS stations and things like that and in art galleries. And and after that, I um, had a chance to work at Saturday Night Live briefly, which uh, was sort of good and bad. And I uh, moved on from there to do Clarissa and did all the TV shows I've done uh, at Disney and Nick and um, PBS. Uh, what years were you doing Saturday Night Live? I was there at the end of the good old days and the beginning of the bad old days. So I was there um, on Mr. Mike's Mondo video with Michael Donahue, which was 79, I think. Mm-hmm. And then um, in 80, it might have been 78. And then in 80, I was part of a, a new cast and crew and... I had a writing and uh, featured performer and video contract, and um, I only appeared in about two sketches. I wrote a bunch of stuff they never did, and I made three films. Ah, yeah, um, you're the second person that we've had on ca- uh, Casual Chats who was there during the 1980s SNL, and that would be Mark Weiner, who appeared occasionally to do his puppet performances. Yeah, I knew Mark, and I actually used Mark in a, a comedy video I produced called uh, New Wave Video. And uh, that was for Vestron, which was a big company at the time. Yeah, he he was he was just an occasional performer, and um, I loved his stuff. I think his stuff is great. Yeah, he's 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 wonderful. Um, Kevin and I had the honor of interviewing Mark twice, and he's always been very wonderful and supportive for uh, especially with um, us discussing about how much uh, his show Wienerville impacted us. Oh, cool. So, um, what made you decide to take the next step into, uh, you know, stepping off from SNL and from writing feature films to eventually starting writing programs for more younger audiences? Well, it just always was something I was doing. I mean, basically in New York, when you work there, um, there's, there's kids and there's comedy, there's Sesame Street and there, in those days anyway, there was Sesame Street and then there was Saturday Night Live. So uh, a lot of people wrote for both of them. And my adult stuff was very kid-like, and my kid stuff was very adult-like. So it was just a matter of which one was going to succeed, you know. And in many ways, writing for kids was just way more interesting and challenging than writing for adults um, at that time. I don't think that's always been true, and it always it's not still always true, but... Saturday Night Live was really boring. I mean, when you look at, when you compare Ren and Stimpy and Saturday Night Live, which one is more interesting? You know, which one is more groundbreaking? Which one is more stimulating, you know? And uh, so, you know, when I had the chance to do 
when I pitched ideas at Saturday Night Live, they thought they were like, you know, too avant-garde. When I pitched them to, to Nickelodeon, they thought they were cool. So, you know, I just went where I could be the most creative. And how did you meet up with the people who would eventually do all the stuff on Nickelodeon? I, um, pretty much like the way I meet everybody. I just sort of see something cool and I try to meet them. And I had tried to, um, I had done a, um, stock footage, uh, special for them, which was one of their first, very first TV shows that they did that was original, uh, called, uh, now a word from our sponsor that used old, uh, TV commercials. And, um, and that was sort of my introduction to the executives there. And then I met Jerry Laybourne, and uh, she gave me a development deal that ended up becoming Clarissa Explains It All. Yeah, we'll get to Clarissa in a minute, but right before we do that, um, what were your experiences like for working on both Doug and Ren and Stimpy? Well, I loved working on all those shows. It was sort of the dawn of a new animation. Um, Ren and Stimpy was literally kind of, in my mind, the clock was reset with Ren and Stimpy. I think whatever people... I think if Ren and Stimpy had been on the Comedy Channel or on MTV, it would be on still today. Um, but at Nick, it was a volatile problem for them, the way they handled it. I don't, I don't blame John at all, oddly enough. I mean, I think he's crazy, but that's not a surprise. And um, so I... I mean, John didn't like anybody, and I'm in the category of people he didn't like. Um, but what he did, I really admired, which was that he he made um, cartoons uh, writers. So me being a writer made me a target for him. Um, but that was okay. It didn't really bother me. I just think he, he did a great job at what he did. Uh, I just think it was unfortunate the way he got handled in the end. And, I mean, he was doing things that would upset everybody, but that's sort of what an artist does, so I wasn't surprised about that. Uh, Doug was um, a little more straightforward, just because Jim Jenkins was obviously much easier to work with. And um, the funny thing was that he was from the same hometown I was, and he was writing about things that were in my hometown. Um, so I knew them, and... I just worked hard to structure those shows. You know, my thing was I was a development and story editor. So my goal was just to um, make sure they were well-structured, make sure they appealed to kids, but also had another level, you know, had kind of a adult level. Doug had less of an adult level than Red and Stimpy or uh, Rugrats, but it was still relatively sophisticated. And I think what it, it shows is that when you add that other level, as kids grow older, they remember more things and they enjoy it more. They have a bigger appreciation for it. What were your favorite behind the scenes um, stuff that happened when doing both Doug and Ren and Stimpy? Well, I just didn't, I wasn't there for the production. You know, it's a, it's not quite um, like TV where there's a behind the scenes thing going on. I mean, the big thing that was going on with Ren and Stimpy was just, all of these battles over storyboards and all these inappropriate stuff that um, John was trying to get into the shows um, that, you know, he'd hand in a storyboard that was like, you know, six inches thick and you really couldn't use one that big. Um, and it had stuff that was, you know, really sadistic and, and crazy in it and that you couldn't really put on a kid's network. But like I say, if it had been on, if it had been like South Park, we actually saw the South Park pilot because they originally pitched it as a kids show, and um, and you look at how much better it is that they're not a kids show. I mean, they would have died as a kids show. So, um, and you know, John just was um, very possessive of his work, and you know, like I say, I don't blame him for that. On Doug. You know, Doug, honestly, Jim Jenkins was similar in the sense that he was possessive of his work, and he should be. I mean, just like I was of Clarissa, you know. And so I enjoyed working with um, those guys. They're, you know, animation's a long, drawn-out process, and things don't happen very instantly. It's more, 
you know, you get a script, you give notes, they take it to the storyboard artist, you get the storyboards, you know, it, it gets shipped off, you see the footage. There wasn't very much outrageous going on behind the scenes on any of those shows. Oh, fair enough. Now, um, now stepping into Clarissa, what were the lessons that you were able to take from working on all the shows that you uh, were, you know, had a little bit of a hand for and eventually did go to do Clarissa? Well, I had done this thing at, um, I had been at a, a network called Comedy Channel before the, was it Comedy Channel? Comedy Network before, is it called the Comedy Channel? What's it called now? Comedy? Comedy Central. Comedy Central, right. So we, we, there was a thing called Comedy Channel that I produced two series on, and I was producing nine episodes a week uh, of um, Rachel Sweet, The Sweet Life, and Higgins, Boys, and Gruber. And Rachel was a former rock star, rock and roller from Cleveland, who was really funny and clever. Now she's a sitcom writer. And Higgins, Boys, and Gruber were this comedy team uh, that now Steve Higgins is Jimmy Kimmel's sidekick. Um, but he was he still is the head writer at Saturday Night Live. Uh, and when I was working on them, they were just starting out. And it was their comedy group. And we did uh, this ridiculous format of three hours of stand-up comedy clips with this really clever rap wraparound by both Rachel and by the Higgins boys. And I, like everybody, got frustrated with the... Um, this like structure and all the creative creativity we were putting in it that no one ever got to see. So I took the Higgins boys um, segments that were the wraparound and I cut them together like a sitcom. And it was a really big deal for me because I didn't write sitcoms before and I had no desire to write sitcoms. In fact, I hated them. And, uh, but when I cut this thing together like a sitcom, it was so wacky and different. It had so many short scenes and they were talking to the camera because they were the hosts and there were all these time jumps and lots of cool stuff was going on. So I thought, wow, I'd love to do a sitcom like this, you know? And uh, so that was one element that I had learned from. And then Rachel's thing was, she was a little more straightforward host, um, but we did these great segments and she had lists and things like that. And I had grown up writing lists and, uh, I'm a huge obsessive compulsive list maker. And so I thought it'd be really cool to do a girl making lists and explaining everything. And, and then, uh, use this format that I had developed on, uh, Higgins boys and Gruber. And I thought that would be cool. So that's, that's sort of where, at least the, the the foundation was, but then I had to write it, and and I had never written a sitcom, so that was a bit of an ordeal. But it turned out pretty good. So, were any of the characters and situations also based off of maybe your life or the the people who were involved with the show's perspectives of how they grew up when putting together Clarissa Explains It All? Not really. I mean, the thing it was. I mean, there were all sorts of cool girls that I knew and I kind of drew on to create Clarissa, but most of them weren't um i mean the funny thing about it is that the girls that were kind of as out there and cool as clarissa weren't you know as nice and um sweet as melissa was clarissa ended up being so um that was a kind of transposition and then um i had been a performance artist so a lot of goofy things that i did in the sh in the show were things that i had done as a performance artist like, um, I had a st whole bit I did on stage in a straitjacket and in video art with me in a straitjacket. And so I still had the straitjacket and I put it on Melissa for the first episode when she was trying to think of how she was going to um, get rid of her brother. So, it, you know, it was just a mixture of all sorts of creative stuff that I had done and no one thing. And, and it was pretty... Um, made up from scratch, pretty much, but just using lots of pieces of things I'd thought about before. Now, speaking of pieces, now, some people, uh, for, from what I read online, there were some people who kind of compared Ferguson to Alex from Family Ties, in which he was obsessed with, like, Republicans and political stuff and being all intellectual, but a, a little bit younger. Um, have you um, have you ever heard of that statement before? And what do yeah, you think? Yeah, that probably came from me. I mean, I, I did think about him. I thought about having a character like that, a real 
you know, right winger in the middle of a um, family that seems kind of liberal, you know. I like that idea. I thought that was really funny, especially since I had here I had Clarissa, who was this girl who was really, you know, innovative and unique. And what would be the most painful thing for her is to have a brother who's a complete, you know, tool, you know, so. <laughs> Uh, so that's, yeah, that was completely, that, that was something I did think about. Oh, that's pretty interesting. And, uh, the same thing would be for like, um, the parents, for example, the, you know, with the, the mom being like the, um, the free bird who's like consistently obsessive with anything organic and vegetarian and, um, you know, also helping out with children at the, the museum. And then her father would be like an architect, um, uh, architect who would build like these really strange buildings. So it's, it's kind of like the, the instance in which it's kind of really out of the ordinary, but at the same time, despite it being really out of the ordinary and strange, a lot of people can really relate to it, which is why I think the show worked the first time. And, you know, when looking back on Clarissa Explains It All, I mean, there are there are some cases in which it does kind of speak of the time, but at the same time, there are some things that you can be able to pick that definitely can still be relatable for people of um, today in which, you know, you have somebody like Melissa who portrayed as Clarissa and she's, you know, portrayed as this very sweet girl, but at the same time, she kind of has like a little bit of an edge towards her of not liking her brother, her parents being weird, her best friend always being at her side, thinking about... Do- you know, what to do in situations that come to her, like not watching TV for a week or helping her brother uh, prevent this bully from beating him up. And then the bully ends up falling in love with her and eventually learning about how to get a, a driver's license, kicking off her aunt out of the way because her aunt is really weird and Canadian. And then eventually her love of journalism and so on and so forth. I think that's what really made it um, kind of different from everything else at the time because, you know, during that time period, like around the late 80s and early 90s, everybody was trying to be the next Saved by the Bell or everybody was trying to be the next Full House in which you have all these families together and they do a whole bunch of things that kind of, you know, showcase the the fakeness of what people go through in school and home, but... Um, with Clarissa, it's kind of also, you know, de- dealt with that a tiny bit, but at the same time, it spoke real to the audience, which I think was very much well needed. And I think that's what made people still remember it even after all these years. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is that people are weird. It's just that they don't, they act normal. Yeah, and Will McRobb and I, we talked about that very briefly when he was on our podcast discussing about Pete and Pete, in which. Yeah, people, you know, they pretend to act normal, but there's a little touch of surreal quirkiness on all of us that you yeah, know, we'd no, love to deny at times. Everybody, it's only when people are fully acting weird do you think they're weird, because people are friggin' weird. That's why that I cast Melissa in the part, because she's so normal. And when I had a really normal person performing all of her stuff, it just made it more acceptable and palatable and seemed cool, you know? And, um, whereas if I had picked somebody who was really out there, it would have made it a lot less, um, palatable for everybody. And then the other thing is that families are filled with people who are completely different from each other. They're not all the same at all. And so that's another thing that is held together by the fact that everybody is, pretty nice you know if, if everybody wasn't essentially nice even Ferguson isn't you know I mean he's an idiot but he's not he's not he's not really nasty you know what I mean he's not nasty on a level on a Donald Trump maybe if I did it now I'd have to make him like Donald Trump but, oh. <laughs> but um but for then it was you know he wasn't that mean you know so he Every, because everybody's nice, they can be really weird. The, the nicer people are and the more normal people are, the weirder they can be, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think so, too. 
So how did the writing style kind of change from each season as the characters grew older and the situations became a lot more different? Because throughout the later seasons, we focus more on Clarissa going to school and experiencing more things in her teenhood and wanting to become a journalist. In the last episode, that final scene in which she writes down the newspaper article and discussing about, you know, what's her life going to be later on. And it kind of leaves it ambiguous as to know about, you know, hey, what's going to happen next, which um, we'll get to in a minute when discussing about Clarissa now. So, um, was it like really difficult for you to kind of shift and, you know, change the, um, the way that the stories were being structured in the first handful of, uh, episodes throughout the first and second season? Or was the, the transition, like maybe with the actors and the writers, like knowing about what you guys were writing made it a lot easier to do? Well, it wasn't, um, it's more just, you're in a, when you're doing those shows, you're just in the process and you just are always trying to come up with the next idea. And so that's that's the biggest thing that drives you. It's not that so much you're consciously changing it, but you're trying to accommodate, you know, an older kid, and a, and you've done this many stories about the same old things, and you've got to move somewhere and go somewhere with it that's further, and and um, so you know that's that's more what drives you is is trying to be original and. So there wasn't any conscious change. I mean, you're also always trying to mold the show around uh, the performer, around Melissa. We were always trying to make it more like her and hope that she became more like the character, which roughly happened, you know. And um, so we just we just kept plugging away, and um, I did want to keep her going, and obviously that's why I did the CBS pilot. Um, and it would have worked if I hadn't been sort of torpedoed on it. But um, so, yeah, it's just um, it's just a matter of uh, you just keep trying to be original and do something new. This was discussed briefly in various interviews online and uh, in the book Slimed in Oral History of Nickelodeon's Golden Age. But uh, Clarissa explains it all had a CD, uh, Clarissa and the Straight Jackets. Uh, what's the story right. behind that? Well, I really wanted her to cut a record. And this was before people, you know, realized that an actress, you know, my show was before everybody realized what you could do with a show like that. And so a lot of people didn't really understand me when I tried to do that. And I got Rachel Sweet, who was the woman whose show I produced and who did the theme song for Clarissa, and her partner to produce um, a uh, record with Melissa and she wasn't a natural singer, but we, we got a lot of good stuff out of her. And it was just this situation where once we produced it, it was fun. I mean, it was a lot of fun, and I thought it was pretty good. And once we produced it, um, they felt like it was too mature, like it was too too good. It was too much like a regular rock and roll song uh, record. And they wanted, it was sort of in this grunge sort of nirvana mode, rock and roll mode with long tracks and stuff, and they wanted to make it more younger. And it was a real drag because we had a really, a great record. And they insisted on adding all sorts of crap to it. And I finally took my name off it just because it was too, it was just too annoying. I didn't want to be involved with it, but I did do it really. Well, I, I listened to it recently and yeah, it does kind of sound a little bit more like Nirvana discussing about, you know, like songs such as like uh, P E A C E. It does really c- consist of that kind of grunge, yeah. realistic kind of tone in which we're going to sing about how we feel and right. we're going to be able to portray on, um, you know, what people are going through that maybe they didn't want to speak out loud of how they really felt deep down inside. It was kind of like yeah. with, you know, how, you know, in previous generations about how people who grew up in like this very tight, stricken world in the 1950s and then the 60s came along and we had right. hippies coming along and saying, you know, we want to be free. We want to express ourselves. And that, I felt that that's what, that what you were doing. And, you know, in between you had, you know, Clarissa trying to deal with um, having the songs being recorded and then constantly being interrupted on the phone with whoever was talking to her and so on and so forth. Well, see, I didn't want to do that part. That, yeah. That was a, a ripoff of something I had done before. I'd done something in my video art days called the telephone stories mm. where you would call somebody and they would be in the middle of doing stuff and it was an art exhibit that went to the Whitney Museum and all around the country 
It was on NPR even. Um, and so we ended up doing that, but I, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to have a record of some great songs. And this was before, you know, Lizzie McGuire and uh, Miley Cyrus and, and they just, you know, look, we didn't sell any merchandise on Clarissa. We didn't have any clothing from Clarissa. We didn't, we had a board game. That's all we had. Oh, I remember you know? that board game, actually. I used to own that board game as a kid, yeah. where Clarissa really tried good? to get pieces together so she can get herself her own car and driver's license. Yeah. I wrote that board game. It was a really good board game. Yeah, it, it felt like the show, pretty much. Yeah. So uh, when looking back on Clarissa Explains It All, and you were telling me before we started recording that it wasn't until, um, you know, when just when you went to the Slime Book event at 90 Second Y was you, when you realized that now people were really um, loving the show and they said about how much it meant to them as kids. And, you know, how do you feel about that um, when listening to it like all these years later? Uh, well, I had a, every time I taught at Southampton College, I got a little bit of sense of it. But I didn't really get how big a deal it was. And then at UCSB, one day I taught um, actually a science course. And the people were just, they just knew all my jokes. They knew all my stuff. And they, and I felt like that they were, they just, I mean, I just felt the vibe from them that they uh, grew up with my stuff. And then I would start, I'd be at a ski resort and, and people would find out and they'd go crazy. And everybody started saying things like, oh, I grew up with that show. That was my childhood. And so that was just a huge kind of, watershed of um you know of people liking my show and appreciating what we had done even if they didn't understand all of it when they were a kid and uh and i had already started thinking about writing a um novel so it just was perfect timing um I, i'm just lucky that everybody you know remembered the show so well and got all the different kinds of inside jokes that were in it and um and what was different about the show, really, they remembered that, which was really cool. Even still to this day, people still really regard on Clarissa Explains It All. Uh, every time that, um, you know, one of the actors on Twitter, like, you know, same like Melissa Joan Hart, they would be talking about, like Clarissa, you know, she would always be retweeting it, saying like, you know, thank you so much, uh, you know, being on Clarissa means a lot to me, and so on and so forth. And I see a lot of people discussing about how, you know, they wanted to grow up to be like Clarissa, wanting to be rebellious, but at the same time being intellectual and being willing to, you know, um, express themselves and just, you know, dress however they wanted because Clarissa always had that out there kind of fashion. So. Right. Or, you know, they, they you know, for a lot of people, they really resonated with Clarissa. And, you know, yeah. this would be years before, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, you know, channels would have all these, like, teen sitcoms, like, that we have nowadays. So, right. you know, so for a lot of people, I mean, Clarissa was, like, one of the people that they looked up to. Yeah, it's cool. Why did you pitch it to CBS to do Clarissa now as opposed to continuing it on Nickelodeon? They wouldn't let me. Really? Not even yeah, on Nick at Night? No, they didn't want to continue the series. They said she had, she was too old for the network. And uh, I just thought it was incredibly short-sighted. And there was nowhere to go. So I um, pitched to um, CBS. And at first, they were really good. They really got it. They wanted to do it. Um, but then it went south after that. But um, yeah, Nickelodeon... Felt she was too old for the network. They couldn't understand how they could keep going with her, and I thought they were wrong, obviously. There could have been so many other directions they could have gone with. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, even with, like, later on, like, when Melissa went off to do Sabrina the Teenage Witch, they continued it with yeah. her in college, and they had, like, that the, the Sabrina the Teenage Witch movie. There could have been so many possibilities for Clarissa. We could have gone to MTV, you know. We could have been on MTV with her, you know. They just, they were very, it was like Logan's run for kid stars they wouldn't let them age up and uh and that was just a drag so i took it to cbs i thought they would be originally they bought into the whole idea um but then they uh other things happened you know um did were there a lot of changes that had to um occur because uh, you know for cbs it was more for an adult uh it was more like an adult channel so you, knowing that 
people who grew up with Clarissa were going to probably see Clarissa now. But then again, you had to generate toward an audience who maybe didn't know about Clarissa Explains It All because maybe they weren't of that age. Was it kind of... Um, was it kind of difficult for, you know, for it to be pitched or it would have gone really well had it not been for maybe some, or maybe a wrong place, wrong time kind of thing? No, no. Here's what happened. So there was a, the, the new show, Clarissa Now, if I had gotten to do it the way I wanted to, was totally in the tradition of Mary Tyler Moore and um, uh, whatever her name is, the one, the other one. Uh, why can't I think of it right now? Um, in New York. Oh, what was her name? The, uh, that girl. It was totally in the tradition of that girl and Mary Tyler Moore. And it would have been totally understandable. The only kind of, she would have been a little younger than them, um, which was a good thing in those days. And she, uh, would have talked to the camera and had more fantasies and have been more like, you know, have been like Clarissa. And there was no reason why the audience couldn't have uh, appreciated it. What happened to that show was, after I'd written a bunch of drafts, I had cast all the, I did all the casting myself. I had gotten Marion Seldes and Robert Klein and all these great, Lisa Gay Hamilton, all these great people to play um, in the show. Um, and I had even built the set. So that's like they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm, interesting. Then they, uh, something happened behind the scenes and the exec, um, they pulled the plug on my work and they hired another writer to come in and they got rid of all the uh, narration and all of the, oh, they, I guess there's a little narration, a little bit of talking to the camera, but most of it's gone. And they got rid of um, the graphics and the regular kind of style of the show, the fantasies, everything. And, um, and I said to them, why are you doing this? You know, you've, Obviously, it worked before on Clarissa. Why wouldn't it work now? And they said, oh, you can't get away with that stuff on network TV, you know. And, um, you know, now you see all sorts of shows that do all sorts of stuff like what I was doing on Clarissa on network TV. It was bullshit. It, it, it wasn't about that. And then, I mean, I mean, maybe that's what they decided. But um, and then they basically I was like what I call a zombie producer on that show. I mean. I wasn't fired, but I was no longer in charge. And I um, had to submit to this uh, new writer who did not like Melissa and did not like the show and was like really this angry, grumpy person who didn't even want to meet her and talk to her about what uh, she talked, the way she talked and to get to know her a little bit and resented that she was this blonde girl, you know, and and so it was a nightmare. And then what happens in Hollywood and what happens in popular culture is when something fails, especially if they don't have a way of knowing what happened behind the scenes, they blame the show, you know, and, and, and in Hollywood, they always do. The same executives that got a show like mine and then, you know, shortly after they, um, they say, oh, well, obviously it didn't work, but that's because they gutted it, you know, so... So, yeah, I, I think the show would have worked. Uh, it certainly would have been a lot better. Um, the cast was amazing. I don't see why we wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And uh, and But it's not because there was anything wrong with the show originally. I mean, the, the, the show they produced was never supposed to be shown. That's the other thing that I felt was incredibly, was a big violation, is that no one was ever supposed to see that if it was a pilot. I don't know what what rules they 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 kind of broke on that one, but um, that was a pilot. It was only supposed to be seen if it was going to series, and instead they gave it to Nickelodeon for nothing, and they ran it, which is I don't even think legal, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, our, our, they aired it during the uh, big helpathon when yeah, Melissa exactly. actually appeared as a special guest. Oh, and by the way, um, you were discussing about you know the other girl. I, I think it was Valerie Harper who played as Rhoda. No, there was a TV series called That Girl with, I forget the star, the woman that was a star of it. Uh, uh, let, me, she wrote let me just, let me just look Free it up. to Me. She wrote Free to Be, You and Me. Um, um, I think she was married to um, Phil Donahue. Um, famous actress. Uh, anyway. Marlo, Marlo Thomas. Yeah, Mar it was Marlo Thomas. It was totally in the mold of Marlo Thomas and 
Mary Tyler Moore. It was a girl in New York show, just like those shows. That, that's a that's a tried and true kind of structure, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I see what you're getting at, and um, yeah, um, a few of uh, my friends and I we do this. Um, I, I do a second uh, podcast miniseries called Nick Smithle, where we discuss about uh, rejected Nickelodeon projects. And last summer we discussed about Nickelodeon projects that eventually moved on to other networks, and we were discussing about Clarissa now. And what their opinions of it was, and granted, they're a lot younger than me. They're like half my age. So they were saying when they looked up Clarissa now, they were like saying it didn't feel like Clarissa. It felt too much like a sitcom. A lot of the stuff that was on Clarissa just wasn't there. And it just it, it didn't feel like it was Clarissa at all. And Well, that's the thing. They, they completely got rid of anything that was unique about Clarissa. And they made it like a standard sitcom. And that's boring. You know, yeah. Who needs that? And also, you know... With another thing that we were talking about was that there was no diverse sets. I mean, when you think about Clarissa, you think about like all throughout the house. You think about the school. Yeah. You think about the scenes in which Clarissa would go into her computer game. You think about her imaginations. You think about the charts yeah. that would pop up every time that she would be discussing about something. But the only scenes that you would get is like you have the beginning in which it's in the subway, and then right. pretty much throughout ninety five percent of the entire pilot, it's just in the office, and the office is pretty much empty with pretty much nothing there to excite yeah. the viewers. It's nothing. Well, that's not the way I wrote it. So that's what happened when they when this girl got a hold of it, and when the network changed it. Yeah. Well, I gotta say, Mitchell, that. Times certainly have changed since then. Now people are really excited about, hey, you know, all those shows that we liked 20 or 30 years ago, let's bring it back for our old generation and maybe possibly get a hold of the new ones. Yeah, well, and even that can be terrible if they don't do it well. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Have you seen The Fuller House? I have not, but I have seen the trailers for it. I've seen all the articles for it. I, maybe I'll see it. I'm not sure, but... I know about it. I know about Girl Meets World. Um, I know that uh, Gilmore Girls is having a revival on Netflix. And I mean, I know that Boy Girl Meets World is supposedly getting more and more like Clarissa every day. I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that too. I've heard that you know it's slowly drifting away from being a typical current modern Disney Channel show and trying to be like Clarissa, where it's focusing on, hey, we have a teenage girl going through her life with her parents and stuff like that. So right, yeah. Anyway, so now that we have Clarissa now out of the way, um, so let's discuss about your other pro projects. And I know for our younger listeners, they probably want to know a little bit more about Big in the Big Bear in the Big Blue House because um, sure, uh, I didn't grow up with it. I was too old when that show came out. But um, Noel McNeil, who um, I grew up with with Magellan on Eureka's Castle, he was uh -huh. amazing in that show. And so. Um, I know that, you know, when reading the book Slimed, a lot of the people who worked on Nickelodeon, they eventually went over to work on the Disney Channel. You know, like you right. know, Paul and Joe going off to do Recess. A lot of the writers went off to do a lot of the, um, you know, writing a lot of the cartoons on Disney Channel. Geraldine Laybourne would be the president of Disney Channel until 2000. Right. So um, was that kind of like the similar thing for you, too, in which Nickelodeon kind of like grew too much of a company and not more of a of the fun, small, independent company that it once was in which it had a lot of more freedom. And, you know, then, you know, it just kind of became too much of a business. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's sort of a cart before the horse thing a little bit, which is basically I'm always trying to do something different. And when a network. I'll keep doing it the same network. I'd be crazy not to. I'd be happy to stay as long as they let me do something. But when they stop letting me do things, I don't really do the normal thing. So I have to go someplace where they're going to let me do something that I do and something original. And um, Nickelodeon didn't have any kind of uh, preschool in those days. Um, so, um, and I was actually over at, I mean, Rich Ross was there and Ann Sweeney was there from Nickelodeon, but Jerry hadn't gotten there yet. Well, I guess she did get there. She got there while I was working on it. So um, anyway, so yeah, and I wish she had stayed because if they had stayed, we would have done even more wonderful things. Because Disney also, as much as they're successful, they, they're they way more formula again. Um, when we were doing Bear in the Big Blue House, they were doing Roly Poly Oli. They were trying to really open up in a lot of ways. Um, because that's anywhere Jerry goes, she tries to do that. And it's great for artists like me to work with people that are trying to do that. So 
Yeah, so I got over it. So, yeah, Nickelodeon just wasn't... Um, and let's face it, Nickelodeon's been in one kind of decline or another for a while, mainly because they stopped being original and they stopped being groundbreakers, you know, because that's the brand. You know, when you have a brand that's all about doing the latest kind of newest different thing, you have to keep doing that. If you suddenly start trying to emulate Disney because they're rating success, it doesn't uh, resonate. I mean, that's not to say that SpongeBob isn't good and a bunch of things aren't good and people will be nostalgia for whatever shows were in their childhood, that's always going to happen. But what was unique about the Nickelodeon moment was that we were truly about being innovative and truly about creating new paradigms. And that's a different kind of memory that you have. You can have a pure nostalgic memory for what you grow up with, but there's a, a different kind of nostalgic memory for something that was groundbreaking, you know, because it was the first of its kind. Um, but so anyways, yeah, so I went over to Disney and um, it actually was Henson I was working with. Um, and although I knew the executives at Disney because they had been at Nickelodeon and um, I actually briefly, uh, they were negotiating with me to run TV animation at Disney, which um, I almost did. It would have been a disaster for me. Um, and I had a, a fateful interview where Mike Ovitz asked me why um, I thought I could run TV animation at Disney. And I said, well, I don't think that's the right question. I think the question is, why are you crazy enough to hire me to do that? And, uh, and I think that was the end of the deal, um, But uh, which was fine with me because it wasn't the right place. And anyway, meanwhile, Henson had offered me a deal. And I really felt like Henson needed its own Barney. And I wanted to create... Uh, I'd been fascinated by the idea of building a house and the how the house is like a really cool thing for kids to explore an imaginary house and everything. So I had tried to do in one form or another bear a couple of times until I finally set, found the formula for it. And really at the moment, you know, nobody really expected it to be a big hit, you know, because Disney was only 14 million homes, which isn't very many. And my show costs like, Again, just like Clarissa, it cost like a third of what everybody else was spending on everything. And um, and then it took off, you know. It was just, um, it was, it was. I mean, Clarissa was a beautiful show to work on, um, certainly in the first season. Um, but uh, Bear was always a really beautiful show to work on. There was just so much goodness about it. From somebody who didn't grow up with the show, and I interviewed Noel McNeil a few years ago, and he was telling stories about how much Bear in the Big Blue House was an impact. There was one story he talked about in which there was a girl who was autistic, and she didn't really speak to her family at all. And then the um, the scenes in which Bear would greet the kids, and he would stick his nose on the TV, and you know she reacted to it. She pointed to it on the TV, and then she became more talkative and more active in front of her family and I, I also heard stories about how even still to this day whenever that Noel would be doing um, puppet show um, seminars you know there would be a lot of people who grew up with that show and he even still gets fan art of uh, Bear in the Big Blue House and even fan letters saying about how much it meant to them so oh yeah I get that too all the time there was a guy whose son um the first word he, he didn't speak until he was seven and the first word he said was bear and then he talks about all the relationships between people in terms of what happened between ojo and bear and pip and pop and he's graduated high school and he still watches the show but he watches in chinese and japanese and arabic oh, and wow. uh, yeah it's a great it was a it it works for uh all kinds of kids with special needs because Bear is a protector of children. Um, it's, it's sort of overlooked in kids' TV that we don't create very many protectors of children. We create a lot of, uh, people create a lot of infantilized uh, characters. So, like, my joke used to be that if you were in a fight, would you want uh, Barney, Big Bird, Elmo, or Bear on your side? And... Bear's an adult with an adult voice. He's a protector, you know, and that's hugely reassuring. And the transitions in 
the show are really gentle for autistic kids and kids with or any old kid, you know. And it was really uh, beautiful and gorgeous and lush at the same time and funny, but no one's ever mean. And um, but there's and, and we don't sugarcoat like we did a doctor show where it's about getting a shot. And, uh, you know, everybody always sort of says, oh, it won't hurt. It won't hurt. We never said that. We said it, it hurts. <laughs> just say, ow, say it now, just say, ow, and it's over. And, you know, that was our mode was to be both truthful and, and positive And, and yeah, it was a huge, I, I've been, uh, recently involved with the autistic community a bunch and it, there's just a huge love for that show, um, yeah, th- that would have been a show that I probably would have appreciated as a kid. Yeah, I'm autistic myself. I have I I grew up with Asperger's syndrome, and um, it it was a bit tough at times. You know, growing up, you know, being surrounded by uh, you know people who didn't understand me. And I'm glad that in recent years, like you know, going back to Noel, he's doing like his own little um, puppet series called The Show Me Show, where it's about a kid who has autism and. It's describing about colors and shapes and telling the audience about, um, you know, how to, you know, interact with your um, children who have autism. And I have, actually have a friend of mine uh, who um, does a little series that teaches uh, about how autism affects people for little kids. And I'm glad that, you know, it, it used to be back then in which autism was seen as something bad and now now that there's more people who are going through that, I'm glad that it's been a lot more open to showcasing that, you know, sometimes people who are suffering from autism, they're, they're just like you and me. It's just that they need help in certain things. And, you know, with shows like that, um, I'm glad that people are able to able to be free and be able to express well, themselves. Well, let me ask you a question. You're saying you have Asperger's? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I do. Yeah. Oh, Okay. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I've actually been doing a lot of research about all this, uh, all this right now. Um, and, um, it's very interesting. Um, I, I don't know the exact statistic, but apparently there's something like one in four people, you know, either know someone or have, uh, something, you know, in this area. And there are so many, and, uh, and half of what, um, needs to happen isn't just something for people with um, Asperger's or autism, but also for people to understand it and people to know how to work with people who have it. So it's not such a um, a shock that they have ways to communicate. Um, so yeah, and there's a beautiful movie that you ought to see that just came out yesterday. Um, I don't know if it's in your area. It's got a certain limited run. It's called uh, Jack, uh, uh, the King of Hearts. It's a beautiful movie, but it's also going to be on Lifetime, so you're sure to be able to see it. And it's just, it's about a, a girl who's a runaway kind of con artist who uh, takes a job being a babysitter and doesn't realize what she's in for because the girl's autistic. And it's amazing. It's it's just one of the best movies I've seen recently. Oh wow! I definitely need to check it out then. Yeah, yeah, because I think yeah. Matthew was discussing about it in his uh, slimed uh, Facebook page about the top five movies that he saw this uh, the past year, and I think he mentioned that being one of them. So I'll definitely have to check it out. Matthew has seen it. I think so. I think he mentioned wow. it. Let me see if I can bring up the. Um, the article real quick because I know he mentioned uh, Room, which I've read the book, and that's also um, that's also a movie I really want to see. Um, oh, it's called Jack of the Red Hearts. That's what it's called. Yeah, let me see if I can. Let me see if uh, Matthew's seen it. Uh, no, actually, I'm I'm sorry, he didn't see it. I think it was I, I confused it with somebody else, but I do know somebody who did see it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check it out. And I'm working with her on some projects because I think she, the woman that directed it, Janet Grillo, I just think she's brilliant. So Okay, then. I'll definitely have to check it out then. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, two more things we can discuss about right before we uh, conclude the podcast. Um, so, you know, as time went on, you went off to do, like, other TV shows and you went off to do other projects. Uh, but, you know, the more recent one that you did was you've written a book about Audrey Hepburn. So... 
What made, uh, were you always fascinated by her movies, like Breakfast and Tiffany's, Roman Holiday, Sabrina? No. No? It's not as direct as all that. Um, it's... Um, I actually was doing Clarissa, and uh, Melissa, when we first started working with her, still had a little bit of a Long Island accent, and there was a certain kind of interesting transformation she went through to become Clarissa from where she grew up and stuff, and I knew where she grew up, and I had met her mother and father, and and she, um, and then I did one episode with her where we dressed her up as if she was a punker in uh, Long Island, and... Uh, she sort of regressed into this sort of, I don't think she was ever a punker, but we gave her a nose ring and we made her, you know, this tough girl with big hair. And, um, and it made me just think about the power of transformation in women and how they can, you know, change the clothes they're wearing and, and they become somebody else. And, um, I, had always liked Audrey Hepburn. I wasn't a fanatic or anything, but I always liked the idea of Audrey Hepburn a lot. I liked the idea that she made her look and made herself into what she became and that she broke with the studio system to become this independent actress. And uh, so it was an idea I literally had for Melissa way back when um, and had pitched it to her once. Uh, but it never happened where uh, it was when she, I felt at some moment early in her career, she had a certain uh, Winona Ryder quality and I think she could have done it. Um, now we're talking about like R R Winona Ryder from like singles kind of thing. From Beetlejuice. Like, oh, from, yeah. And, because um, Winona Ryder was also in singles and apparently yeah. according to what a lot of people say, it kind of influenced the grunge era. So I was just thinking about yeah. that when you were talking about how Melissa dressed up in like this outfit that had the nose ring and everything. Yeah. So it was interesting, you know, and um, so I really uh, had thought about this idea for 20 years before I wrote it. And uh, when I finally uh, decided I'd write it as a novel, it just grew and became much deeper and better and better. And I love it. It's, you know, it's about self-transformation. And I guarantee you, you've done some self-transformation from your background. I certainly have from my background. And and it's a really important thing. The people that are able to transform themselves are the people that are able to get past what they grew up with. And to, they're the people that can change the bad things that happen in the world, you know, in my opinion. And... Um, so that's what that book is about. It's really about self-transformation and this girl from New Jersey who gets through her crummy life by watching Audrey Hepburn movies and she gets a tra chance to try on the Givenchy dress and passes as an ingenue and sort of gets to be who she wants to be by pretending to be somebody else um, and naturally that can't last uh, forever. But just like the Cinderella story doesn't last. But it's a, it's a really interesting story, a rich story. Um, that, that sounds very interesting. And, you know, I haven't read the book yet, but um, I'll definitely have to take a look into it if I have. Well, let me know what you think when you do. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And uh, speaking of books, um, I guess we'll kind of talk about, you know, the, the, the most recent one is things I can't explain. And, you know, for any of you guys who have been longtime followers of me. A few years ago, I actually posted when I first heard the announcement that I was really looking forward to the book and discussing about, you know, what the book was going to be about, about Clarissa in her 20s and, you know, how I felt about it. And I was really excited. And apparently you saw that video? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. That, I did. That, that looks, I, I'm sorry, that looks terrible by today's standards. How the did audio you hear is that crap. I saw it though? Uh, but thank you for watching it. I really do appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no, I, I love anybody that, like, follows my stuff. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what made you decide to find, I mean, I know that you try to do it with Clarissa now, but why did you finally decide to, you know, after all these years, go back to finishing up the story of Clarissa that you always wanted to do? What, what, got, what got you that spark? Was it? Well, I never gave up, first of all, oh. wanting to do oh. it. Oh. And then I always, I did a lot of, Film, I wrote a lot of movies and sitcom pilots that had not Clarissa, but a girl was Clarissa-like in certain ways and growing up. I had been, I've been wanting to grow her up for a long time. She never really left in my mind at all. And uh, 
I wasn't finished. I never was. Uh, when I wrote, started writing the Being Audrey Hepburn novel, I thought, oh, shit, I'll just write it as a novel. Hell with all these people. And um, I realized I had the rights to write it as a novel. And I was lucky enough to get a publisher, and, and I wrote it. And it wasn't completely easy to do because um, it's a sitcom, Clarissa. And so it doesn't literally translate into... Um, uh, novel, but I had to, I had to find that balance of tone between the silliness of the show and the a little more heaviness of a novel. And I also wanted to see her get her ass kicked um, because she never had it happen to her in the show. And those were things that I really wanted to see happen. And I got to do all the stuff I never got to do in the show. And it was a lot of it was wish fulfillment. It was almost like fan fiction in a funny way. <laughs> Um, because I, I had to actually go back and remember a lot of stuff and try to capture her voice again, which was hard at first. And so, yeah, I loved it. I loved everything about it, you know? Yeah. And, um, again, I've been hearing a lot of people who have read the book, they're saying it's great. It's like, you know, seeing Clarissa again, um, you know, on TV, except that she's roughly around my age and she's yeah. going through much more, uh, struggles that are more harder and realistic that uh, probably I went through because, you know, she, it, it, just like if you were to watch the show, you know, she wants to be a journalist and obviously she would move to New York, which makes total sense. But guess what? It's not easy. I mean, especially nowadays in, you know, 2016, you know, being a journalist is getting a lot harder because of the internet and because of, you know, going in from a small town, um, you know, that she lived in in the show and then moving into the big city and practically knowing nobody and having struggles with relationships and so on and so forth. It's, let's be honest, it sucks. But, you know, again, it's, you know, from what I've been hearing from a lot of people, it's wonderful that you're able to finally tackle this and you're able to finally say the story that you've wanted to say because I know a lot of people who really like it and I wouldn't be surprised if there would be more people who want to see more, like, Maybe a Clarissa Explains It All reunion, or maybe like one of those one-hour TV specials, or maybe like a five-minute clip online where you get to see some of the cast members reunite. So, um, you know, I, I just want to let you know that, you know, it's great to finally have Clarissa back in our, you know, day and age. Yeah, no, I'm really excited about it, too. Um, and I do hope that there'll be, um, there'll be more... Um, I feel like there could be a Clarissa multiverse <laughs> where there's Clarissas of every age like existing at the same time. <laughs> the Doctor and, Who of Clarissa explains yeah, it all. Right. <laughs> Doctor Who, yeah, the Doctor Who of Clarissa, that's a good line. So, yeah, so I feel like there could be, and, and you don't, I mean, it might happen. Um, so, uh, and I'd love to write another novel, you know, that would be fine with me too. Um, so, it just... There's been such a great uh, outpouring. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens. But it's been really satisfying. It, it actually got everybody to think seriously about Clarissa again in a way, too. I mean, it was all right. Look, it's amazing to me this week. And, oh, by the way, there's a um, audible version of the book is coming out on the 15th. Uh, you should mention that, and I could even give you a link for a clip if you want it. When the book comes out, uh, I'll definitely put it on the description box below for everybody to check it out if they want to see it on Audible, and I'll even give the uh, Amazon page where they can buy the book. Yeah, I'll if anybody well, I'll is send interested... it to you. I'll send it to you today. Great, yeah. When I have this thing posted on Tuesday, which again, yeah. uh, not Tuesday, I'm sorry, it's... Um, uh, Thursday, yeah, there we go. On Thursday, when I post this, which will be, again, the 25th anniversary when Clarissa Explains It All first uh, debuted on Nickelodeon, I'll have all that stuff posted for anybody who uh, wants to see more of what happens after the show. All right, well, um, I think that should be all the time that we have cool. today, but uh, yeah, um, right before we go, do you have anything to plug or self-promote, any upcoming projects? <laughs> well, just the audible... The Audible's coming out, and there's just a lot of great things coming out. Uh, I have another book I'm finishing now, and I have all sorts of great TV projects. Some of them relate to my old shows and some of them to new shows. I think in the next year and a half, they're all going to come out at one point or another, but uh, it's too early to say them 
what they are specifically, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm having a great time. I'm glad. And where can people find you at? Uh, well, I have MitchellKriegman.com. You can sort of find everything through there. Okay. Um, once again, Mitchell, thank you so much for taking the time for this uh, interview. I really do appreciate it. And thank you so much for everything that you've done with Clarissa and your uh, your books and all of your other projects. Thank you. I thank you for um, for getting in touch with me. Yeah, and uh, that concludes this episode of Casual Chats. Leave in the comments below about how much you know, uh, Clarissa Explains It All or Bear in the Big Blue House or maybe the most recent books of Audrey Hepburn and Things I Can't Explain, how much they mean to you. Tell me your early memories of Clarissa. And uh, yeah, that should be it. And we hope to see you in the next one. So bye. Bye. Bye.